Hey there students, in this video we're going to take a look at the feudal system. Quick shout out to my own students at Seneca High School who may be watching this for a test. Y'all deserve it. So the feudal system developed in medieval Europe after the fall of Rome. Of course, this is a word that can sometimes be applied to medieval Japan as well. And what's important to note right here at first is it's a word that no one used at the time. Feudalism is a term that is made up by historians in order to explain this system of political organization during the Middle Ages. How do we come up with a word to explain it? So at the time, if you would have asked someone what is feudalism, they wouldn't have been able to tell you, but we can tell you now, and that's what I'm going to do. So after the fall of Rome in 476, and even coming up on the fall of Rome, where the barbarian tribes are gaining the upper hand, Europe developed into a much more rural society because people vacated these cities that were becoming dilapidated and crime-ridden, and they were going to rural areas. Also, this network of roads that the Romans were so famous for maintaining began to fall apart, and trade collapsed as well. So most people in the centuries following the fall of Rome lived on medieval manors, okay? A manor is a largely self-sufficient community that's governed by a lord who protects the people, administers justice, and of course profits from their labor. Here is a manor house. Not everybody got to live there, okay? Most people lived in much more modest dwellings. And the people at the very bottom of the medieval totem pole were the serfs. These were were agricultural laborers who were tied to the land they couldn't leave. In a lot of ways, similar to slavery, but not quite. Now, not every medieval peasant was a serf, but serfdom was very prevalent in a lot of medieval societies. So when we talk about feudalism, we're talking about a network of independent communities like this that are tied together by a weak central authority because central authority wasn't really going to work in this society that didn't have a lot of roads, a lot of cities, a lot of trade. And let's think about a chessboard, okay? Because when we're playing chess, anybody who's played before, you don't have to be Kasparov or somebody like that to know that the king is not a very powerful piece. The king is dependent on the support of powerful and nominally subordinate allies, the knights, the bishop who represents the church, the rook who represents the nobility, and of course the peasantry in the form of the pawns. But the king counted on a lot of support in order to keep everything together. This wasn't really like a nation the way we think of it today, much more of a patchwork quilt. And you can see that quilt format here in this map of feudal France in the 15th century, okay? Some people miss France. Maybe some people don't. Maybe some of you have never been there. But when we look at this, we see the king's personal dominions around Paris, but then we also see the Duchy of Burgundy, the Duchy of Brittany, the Kingdom of Navarre, which of course will produce the Bourbon dynasty later on. So all of these different lords are swearing oaths to this king, but the king really doesn't exercise a lot of control over this quilt that was feudal France. So the whole feudal system revolved around a feudal contract where the Lord gave a grant of land known as a fief. That's part of where we get the word feudalism is from this word fief. Now he gets this grant of land that nominally belongs to the king, but the vassal really controls it for all practical purposes. And in return, the vassal gives loyalty, typically in the form of military service, but that could also be in the form of taxation, which is going to be more prevalent in the late Middle Ages. Now note here, I've got a lot of L's here. Lord, land, loyalty. So when you're thinking about the feudal contract, think on one side land and on the other side loyalty as a good starting point. When we look at the feudal hierarchy, of course, we see the king at the very top. Now, the king, this is the only person that is not a vassal to anyone, that is not in the state of vassalage, that is not swearing an oath. Now, of course, there were English kings who had lands in France that swore an oath to the French kings, but then, of course, they attacked them. But typically, the king is not a vassal. The great lords, these are people who swear an oath of vassalage directly to the king, and then they, in turn, have their own vassals 
the lesser lords, who then maintain knights. Now, the knights are not nobles, but they still have land. So let's consider the nobility is made up of the great lords and the lesser lords. The knights, of course, are people with means, but they are not nobility. And then, of course, at the bottom, you have the peasantry. So on one hand, you see the grant of land and legal privileges, even for the peasants, the privilege to use the Lord's oven or just the privilege of protection and simply breathing air, okay? And then on the other side, you had loyalty, which could be manifested in terms of military service, dues, or work obligations. Medieval towns typically existed outside of the feudal hierarchy because they had charters granted to them directly by the king and they did not participate in the life of the manor or owe any specific allegiance to the feudal lord. And this is, of course, part of the reason for the decline of feudalism later on that throughout most of the Middle Ages in medieval Europe, towns were not very common, but that changed in the late Middle Ages. So a few explanations for the decline of feudalism would include the growth of trade and towns. Also, the growth of royal power, which started with the armies that were raised for the Crusades and, of course, continued as royal treasuries gained a lot of money from centralized tax collection and, of course, the increase in global trade during the Age of Exploration. And then, finally, the Black Death, because of 30 to 40 percent of the population being lost, that undermined the ability of the nobility, the ability of the nobility, that has a ring to it, doesn't it? The ability of the nobility, which became the inability of the nobility. <laughs> I should take a quick sip to that one. This inability of the nobility to control the peasantry in the 14th and 15th centuries, you started to see more peasant revolts. So that, of course, contributed to the decline and eventual collapse of feudalism. But we want to note that some elements of feudalism did continue into the modern era. And with that, we're looking at, for example, the French Revolution in 1789, the French National Assembly in the early stages of the French Revolution got rid of all legal privileges for the nobility and what they called feudalism. They got rid of all of the legal privileges of the nobility, which of course were still in effect in most areas of France at that time. Also, if you go to Russia, it's not until the 1860s when Tsar Alexander II finally abolished the institution of serfdom. So we do see some remnants, especially in Eastern Europe, into the modern era. So with that, hopefully you've got a nice introduction of feudalism that will help you on whatever test or research that you are currently working on right now. And remember, if you like that, there's more where that came from, and it's always a pleasure.